Okay, good morning, good morning. and welcome, welcome to the to School of Biomedical, Biomedical Sciences, Sciences webinar. webinar. Uh, this is the uh, first the of first these webinars that we've run, so we're quite, we're quite excited about it, and I hope that you find it really useful and you get the chance to ask the questions that uh, are, are um, on your mind, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions for you. So before we start, I'm going to introduce you to the panel that you can see here. My name is Debbie Bevitt and I'm the head of School of Biomedical Sciences and pass you over to Jeff. I'm Jeff Blossom. I'm the degree programme director and I teach biochemistry. I'm Bimithal. I'm a stage two pharmacology student and I'm also an international student. I'm Jenny Combe. I'm a biomedical genetics graduate and now I work for the university as a graduate ambassador. Hi, and I'm uh, Dr. Nick Morris. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Biomedical Sciences, and I'm also the uh, Director of International Undergraduate Student Studies. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about how the session's going to run this morning. Um, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just giving you an overview of the courses that we run here at Newcastle and tell you a little bit about the city. Um, and then we can um, get into some questions and um, you're able to put the questions onto our live chat. So as soon as a question occurs to you, either during the uh, introduction or afterwards, just type your question into the chat and we'll get back to you uh, after the introduction, uh, answering your questions. Um, if by any chance there's any questions we can't answer this morning, then we'll get back to you straight after the session. Um, and also um, if we run out of time, again, we'll get back to you. So any questions that you put in, we will make sure that you get an answer to those questions. Okay, so um, I think we'll go over to the presentation uh, and uh, tell you a bit about Newcastle. Okay, so you can see here uh, a few images from around Newcastle on this uh, starting slide. Uh, and if you'd like to see more um, about Newcastle and what the city's like and what the campus is like, then what I recommend is go on to the university web pages uh, and you'll be able to find some videos that give you some really good tours around the city and around the campus and get you a give you a real flavour for what the city's like. Um, you can see on these pictures that uh, the sky is nice and blue and I can tell you that actually outside today the sky is indeed blue um, and um, it's a beautiful day here in Newcastle so I hope it's the same wherever you are. So this is an aerial view of Newcastle just to give you an idea of the size of the city and as you can see it's actually quite a compact city um, which uh, most of our students like. You can see that here in the top right where the arrow is um, indicating, that's where the medical school is located and that's where you'll have most of your lectures. You can walk across the city from that uh, point down to the riverside in about 20 minutes. Uh, so it's really very easy to get around. Um, most people manage to walk or cycle from their residences um, into the medical school. Uh, within uh, less than 15 minutes uh, from most of the university accommodation. Some of them much, much closer than that. It's a great city to be a student. There are lots of students here from both Newcastle University and Northumbria University, uh, and there's certainly plenty to do. There's lots of uh, great nightlife. Newcastle is very famous for its nightlife. Um, not only the, the clubs, um, but also some great um, concert venues. So, for example, we have the Sage Concert Hall down on the riverside and also um, a big metro arena where we have larger um, rock concerts. If you're into sport, there's also uh, plenty of sport to watch. So, for example, if you're into football, St James's Park is right in the centre of the city about here. Um, and so you can go and see uh, Newcastle United playing there if that's what you enjoy. So these are the programmes that we offer here in the School of Biomedical Sciences. Um, and hopefully all of you who are signed in will have signed up for one of these courses and are holding an offer for one of these courses. So at the top there, you can see our three year programmes. These are BSc Honours programmes in Biomedical Genetics, Biochemistry, Pharmacology, Physiological Sciences and Biomedical Sciences. 
Um, and then we also offer these four year programmes, the MSI programmes in biomedical sciences, biomedical genetics and biochemistry. And these four year programmes have more of a focus on, on research, particularly in the final year. For all of these programmes from 2017, uh, we're very excited. We've got a new opportunity for you to take a professional placement year uh, between your second and third year. So this is an opportunity um, to go out and work um, perhaps in industry for a year. Um, and that means that your final degree certificate will be, for example, biochemistry with professional placement year. And we believe this is going to give you a real edge in the employment market when you come to looking for jobs at the end of the day, because it tells an employer straight away that you've had that experience uh, working in, uh, uh, in industry. So to get on to those professional placement years, you'll, you'll initially start on the three year programme. You'll get lots of help to try and find a placement if that's what you would like to do. And then if and when you're successful in getting that placement, you'll transfer onto the four year uh, professional placement year programme or five years if you have a placement on the M MSI programme. So this slide summarises the um, structure of the degree programme. So you can see that we have two semesters in the year. Um, so the first semester runs through from September to January and the second semester through from February to June. And uh, each year you will study 120 credits, making up 360 credits over a three year programme. In the first year, all of the students on the programmes that I mentioned on the last slide study together. So you all have the same curriculum. And that means that at the end of the first year, you can actually swap. So if, for example, you uh, arrive on the biochemistry programme, but after studying pharmacology in your first year, you decide that really you would prefer to do pharmacology, then you can swap onto that pharmacology programme. So we allow students to swap between the degree, degree programmes at the end of the first year with, without restrictions. There are no cap on the number of, of students on each of the programmes. And that gives you lots of flexibility to find out about each of those programmes before you make your final decision. After you've made that decision, you then enter phase two of the programme, and this is where you start to specialise in your individual specialist subjects. So you'll take modules which are uh, relating to those specialist areas for your second year and for the first half of your third year. In the final year, in the final semester, you then take a full time 10 week research project. And this is the, the highlight of most students um, university careers with us. Uh, most students tell us they really find that the most interesting and exciting part of the programme where it brings together everything that they've learned over the three years. And this gives you an opportunity to go into one of our research laboratories and carry out your own research project. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. So we are a Russell Group University, and that means that there is lots of very exciting world class research going on here at Newcastle University. You can see here that um, we are ninth in the UK for biomedical sciences and we ranked in the world top 50 for biomedical and health sciences in the Leiden world rankings. So we have a very good reputation for biomedical research and this will feed directly into your teaching. So people in one of our research institutes will be the people who are actually teaching you, particularly in the honours uh, phases of your degree programme. That's phase two. So there are seven research institutes, each specialising in a slightly different area of research. So, for example, the Institute of Genetic Medicine, Institute of Cancer Research and Institute of Neuroscience. Uh, I won't read out all of the institutes that you can see there on the screen, but as you uh, get the idea that each one specialises in a different area. We also have a particular strength in research into ageing, which again will feed into the teaching that you get. Now, obviously, coming to university is about more than just what you study in lectures. It's also about all the other opportunities that are available to you. And there are plenty of opportunities uh, to help you develop your, your skills um, and your experience. 
So for example, many of our students take vacation studentships. So these are work placements in their summer vacation, usually between the second and third year. Many of them are based here in Newcastle in one of our research institutes, but also some students go out into industry to do their placements. I've already mentioned the professional placement year opportunity, and many of our students also take the opportunity to go uh, on overseas placements. So, for example, um, some students take their final year project out in European universities. So we have students who go out to Barcelona uh, in Spain, to Toulouse in France and to Tübingen in Germany um, and uh, a number of other European universities. There's also the opportunity to take the second semester of your second year uh, at Monash University in Australia if you're on our biomedical sciences programme. We have lots of links to companies both locally and uh, across the country uh, to help you to find placement opportunities and we have a dedicated member of staff who helps you to, to do just that. And it, within Newcastle, there are also chances to work in the university, either as part of the Newcastle Work Experience Scheme, or also we offer um, lab assistant posts to students within the school to go and work in our research labs during term time on a part time basis. So all of this is going to help you to develop skills that will make you employable uh, when you when you graduate. In addition to those placement opportunities, there are other things that we have in the curriculum to help you to develop those skills. So I've mentioned the projects already, the 10 week projects, and you can tailor that project to your own career interests. Most students take a research project in uh, one of the laboratories in the research institutes, but others, for example, decide to specialise in clinical audits or perhaps they have more of a flair for information technology and computer based uh, work and they do um, projects, for example, in bioinformatics. And if you are more interested in a career in science communication or in teaching, then you can tailor your project to suit that as well. And to help with this, we also offer a range of vocational modules in the third year, again, helping you to specialise in the area that you're interested in pursuing as a career. So you can see those modules listed here and just to pick out a few of them, um, for example, if you're interested in the NHS uh, and how that works, you might want to do the research, the healthcare um, organisation and practice module. We also offer modules in bioethics, in science communication for those who perhaps would like to go and work in the media or into a science, um, science museum, for example. If you've got a bit of an entrepreneurial flair, then perhaps you would like the business for the bioscientist module. And uh, also we have the bioinformatics module, which is a, a rapidly growing field um, using computer databases and computer programs to handle um, the big data sets that are now coming out of bioscience research. So if you'd like to find out a bit more about what our graduates do, have a look at the profiles that are on our website and you'll get a, a flavour of, of those. So just to summarise, why you might want to come to Newcastle, why we think that students choose to come to us. Well, firstly, we know that students have a great time when they come here. It's a great city to live in. And uh, in the National Student Survey, which is done uh, at the end of uh, for, for final year students across the UK, last year, between 96 and 100 percent of students uh, in on our courses said that overall they were satisfied or very satisfied with the experience they'd had. So we know that uh, students have a good time because that's what they tell us. We offer you this flexibility so you can change your degree programme at the end of the first year. And there's also the option to apply for a transfer to one of, to the uh, medicine and dentistry programmes here in Newcastle at the end of the first year. This is a competitive process. And if you're interested in that, we can tell you more about it in the question and answer session. The teaching that you'll get is very much led by researchers who are at the top of their game and, and leaders in the field. And um, we believe that we will provide you with some great skills that will really help you to get a job when you when you graduate from Newcastle. So uh, I'm going to 
finish uh, just by passing, uh, giving you these links to our Facebook pages and to our Twitter site. Uh, and now we'll open up to questions. Okay, so just bear with me while I find the first questions. Okay, so welcome to everybody. Um, and the first question that's come in is, what is the university accommodation like and is it close to the campus? So I think I'll pass that over to one of our students. Jenny, would you like to pick up on that? We've got a really wide range of accommodation um, at Newcastle University. And a really important thing is if you put us as your firm choice, you are guaranteed um, a place in that accommodation. But we've got a wide range. So if you want an ensuite bathroom or you want a shared bathroom, all the different choices are available. If you want to be really close to the school, you can put that as a preference. Um, I didn't live in accommodation myself because I'm a local student, so I chose to stay at home. Um, but I think Beema can tell us a bit about what it was like. Yeah, um, so I stayed at Turner Court, which is, I think, partnership accommodation. Um, and it was great because you had a subway and a Tesco's downstairs and they were open quite late as well. So that was useful. Um, and I think Turner Court was all on suite. So if that's what you want, um, uh, Turner Court is good for that but then there's Castle Leases which is around a five to ten minute walk from medical school so if you have different priorities if you want something that's close or if you want uh, food as a, uh, if you want so, so something that's like a store like Tesco's that's open quite late and is virtually like two minutes away um, yeah apply for Turner Court yeah okay uh, the next question uh, is what will happen if I don't get my grades Shall I take that one? No. <laughs> okay, so I'll take that one. Um, the answer is if you don't get your grades, uh, please call us on the uh, morning of the results or first of all, check on your UCAS tracker. Um, we take about 400 students into our first year, um, or into each year. And so we almost always have places to offer to students who uh, narrowly miss the grades that they've, uh, that they've been um, offered. Um, so if you slip a grade, the chances are that we will be able to take you onto the course um, and we'll always give priority to students who have put us down as their, as their choice on, on their UCAS application before we start looking at students through clearing. Um, in the last few years, we've always been able to give places to students who've slipped by one grade. Um, so um, do get in touch. If you don't get your grades, there's a good chance we'll still be able to, to take you. Um, okay, the next question I'll hand over to Jeff, which is, is there any work that I need to do before I start? To be honest with you, nope. <laughs> um, once you've done your ear levels, you deserve a bit of a rest. Um, all students, when they start in, in September, uh, you will be given lots of information, module study guides on, on what's going to happen. And I wouldn't worry too much about trying to get that edge. Um, once you get here and you make friends and you learn what the course is all about, you'll find that uh, it's easy to, to, to get into the swing of things. And again, I'll probably ask the students, how did you find that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's, um, I had a good transition from A-levels into university work. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had taken some time out between my A-levels and starting the biomed course to go and study something completely different. So there'd been a couple of years since I'd done my maths, chemistry and biology. But because everyone comes onto the course with slightly different A-level subjects, that first year gets everyone on at the same page. So it was quite um, manageable to keep up with everyone else. OK, thank you. Nick, I'll pass this one to you if that's OK. Is how good are the lab facilities um, and what links does the school have with industry? Um, well, we have a dedicated person to help with the uh, links to industry, particularly if you're looking for a uh, year out type option or even possibly a summer project. Lab facilities at Newcastle are very good indeed. Uh, we have four main large teaching labs that we tend to use a lot with our first year students. And the way the labs are organized is you get the information before you take the practical. There may be a little bit of work to do. You go into the practical. You've got all the instructions and all the equipment that you need there to do the practical. You will be assigned a dedicated demonstrator, which is a sort of teaching assistant we use at university. 
And one of the great things about the labs is they all link in directly to the lectures as well. So it all supports the teaching that you're having in lectures and seminars and it comes together with the labs. The labs are very much designed to help you develop your basic lab skills through your first year and your second year. So when you go into your third year project, you've really got the skills that you need to do a great project and come out with a great degree. Okay, thank you. How did the students find find the labs in the uh, first, second and third year? Did, did they support your projects? Yeah, I thought they were really good. Um, I especially liked the progression of how the labs work. So within your first year, as you say, you're given all the information at step by step and you're kind of led through it. Then in your second year, you might be asked to write a lab report, which um, there's more emphasis on sort of your own scientific methods. So it's kind of taking you step by step to enable you in your final year to then develop your own um, lab project for your research project. So it kind of leads you towards becoming um, a scientist to, to thinking appropriately about research rather than kind of throwing you in at the deep end, which is something I quite liked. Yeah, and also there's demonstrators there as well to help. So if you're not sure on how to set something up or you have a few questions about your lab report, there's always going to be help available. Um, and the next part to that question actually was, are there a range of options when considering placements? Um, and the answer is yes, there are many different options. Uh, we have a link with a, a good number of companies across the UK, ranging from the big pharmaceutical companies. So we have students based, for example, with GlaxoSmithKline, uh, through to uh, smaller biotechnology companies and spin out companies from the university. Um, and we also have students on placements, as I mentioned, uh, over the summer vacation, for example, here at Newcastle in the research labs here. And I think, Jenny, you did one of those placements, didn't you? Yeah, I did a vacation studentship placement um, in the Northern Institute for Cancer Research. So I um, used help from the School of Biomedical Sciences to find that. What they do is every year they post a big list of the supervisors of the projects before. So that's quite a good starting place to look because you know that those um, lecturers are keen to take on students. So I had a look at that list and um, looked at the different projects um, that those supervisors worked on and um, found one that I thought was really interesting um, and emailed him, just went around for a chat and he was like, yeah, if you want to come do a project here, that's fine. Um, and we applied for funding together and I did manage to get funding for my project. So I think I got £1,800 to be able to spend eight weeks in a lab, which was really useful because it meant I could take time off the part time job that I would normally be doing during the summer holidays. Um, and if you are just trying to get experience and you don't mind about the money too much, you can also do um, a project that you don't get paid for if it's more important that you just get a project that you really want. And a girl in my year did that and she actually got published for the work that she did, which then when she's been applying for PhDs this year in her master's year, it's been really useful for her as well. Thank you. <clears throat> um, OK, the next question is um, whether we can explain the transfer to medicine process and how that works. Um, so when you arrive here at Newcastle, uh, we will tell you all about the transfer to medicine process. It's run by the MBBS admissions team um, and um, you will apply for the transfer to medicine uh, around about Christmas of your first year. Um, and what I'd recommend is have a good look at the information on the um, website, on the MBBS website, and you'll find a link to that from our website, which gives you all of the, the details of that transfer. Um, there are, it is a competitive process. There are about seven places available for medicine and two for dentistry. Um, and so um, you do need to be aware uh, that it is competitive. And the transfer is, um, or the selection is based on your UK CAT score, uh, on your personal statement, and if you're successful in getting uh, that far to, uh, to uh, on the basis of an interview. Um, um, and then you would be offered a place conditional on your marks on the first year of, of our programme. Uh, but as I say, if you want more detail, I'd really recommend that you have a look at the link from our website on that, on that uh, process. OK, the next question we've got, uh, I think, again, I'll hand over to the students, perhaps starting with Bimsel, which is, are the locals friendly and is the campus safe? Yeah, definitely. Um, the locals are really friendly and there's 
um, loads of um, volunteering that you can do to um, within the community so you can do um, you can help teach English to refugees do conversation groups like that um, and you can um, do a lot of gardening stuff as well with with locals so I'd say there's a lot of um, opportunities to integrate within the community um, and yeah I'd say it's definitely safe as well there's um, nothing for you to be concerned about or anything yeah okay thank you how about you Jenny yeah, um, I would say it's really friendly. One of the things that lots of my friends who've come up to Newcastle from other parts of the UK or further afield um, have always said, you know, Newcastle's such a friendly city. Um, because I'm from here, it just seems normal to me, but I get the same opinion when I go kind of elsewhere. Sometimes I get a shock that people aren't as friendly as they are in Newcastle. So I think if you come here, you will get a feel for how welcoming the locals are. The students at Newcastle, there's so many of us that we are kind of our own little demographic um, and we are quite good for the economy. So locals do tend to like us um, and they do be really friendly to, to all of the Newcastle students. OK, thank you. Um, I'll pass the next one over to Jeff, which is about teaching hours in first year. How many hours of teaching in the first year? Okay. Uh, for an average week in the first year, you'll do something like uh, 12 to 15 hours of, of lectures. And they tend to be in one hour blocks, or in fact, 50 minute blocks. Uh, we tend not to give more than two back to back um, because that just tires students out a bit too much. So within that week, you'll do like say about 15 hours of lectures. You'll have at least one practical. A typical practical in the first year is around about three hours. But once you go into the second year, the practicals can last up to three days, depending on, on the thing that you need to, to do. Um, to ensure that you're actually learning from the lectures, then we get together in smaller groups. Uh, these are called the tutorial sessions. So you'll be in a groups of 20 to 25 students. And then you'll have one lecturer, one uh, PhD um, supervisor within that group. And there'll be a series of questions that you can work together on, um, come prepared for, um, do some background reading. But then it's about discussing them with your peers, the fellow students in your group. And together you can work out what you fully understand. And the evidence suggests, or it's proven it's the case, that that's a much more effective way of learning. Um, if you start to discuss the things that's been doing. So a typical week, 15 hours worth of lectures, one hour seminar and three hours of practical. Okay, thank you. And is that what you experienced? Yeah. I guess so, it from the horse's mouth as well. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's what we had. Uh, I think yeah. we had a lot more lads in first year as well. Um, um, so that was really useful as well because um, now we're do moving on to lab reports. So we've got all that lab experience from first year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is about support. So what support is available for students? Uh, so I, I'll start off with that and then hand over to, to the students. So uh, the, the, there are various layers of support, if you like, uh, that we have to make sure that you make the transition to university a successful one. Uh, the first thing is that we will put you in touch with one of our current students so they'll act as your peer mentor so peer mentors are second and third year students um, who um, look after uh, the uh, new students as they arrive um, so we'll put you in touch with them they'll get in touch with you before you arrive at, New at Newcastle University so you'll already have a contact and then in the first week of term we have a timetable session where you'll meet your peer mentor uh, and after that, um, it's a relatively informal case of meeting up with them, uh, perhaps for a coffee from time to time, just to make sure that all, all is going well. Um, there's then another timetable session at the start of your second semester. Um, and again, you can ask them any questions that you like uh, about things that, uh, that are perhaps uh, um, troubling you at the time. Perhaps you're thinking about uh, the revision for your first set of exams uh, that take place at the end of January. So that peer mentor session is a good uh, chance to, to chat about all of that. Um, the second person who will be here to support you is your personal tutor. So that's a member of academic staff um, and they will be your main po point of contact throughout your course. And you'll meet up with them again, firstly, uh, during the induction week. Uh, and after that, uh, again, in the first semester, and then at least once a semester after that until you graduate. 
so again, that's a, a member of academic staff who you can go to, uh, who'll um, just um, keep an eye on your progress. If you've got any particular problems or concerns, you can go and ask them. And if they can't help you, they'll point you in the direction of, of somebody who can. So I'll just uh, again hand over to the students and, and find out how, how your experience was of the support you had in, in transitioning to university. Yeah, so I found the peer mentoring scheme really helpful. So um, it was useful to have someone who'd been through the same experiences um, there on hand to answer any questions I had. Um, and um, sh she was also really knowledgeable about um, applying for different things like this, say the transfer she'd already done. Um, so I could ask questions about that or placements, etc. as well. And I'm still in touch with my peer mentor. Um, I still talk to her and I have questions about third year. So it's, I think it's a really good scheme as well. Um, yeah, I think the student support um, within the school and the university is really good. Um, obviously, you always think you might not need any support when you get there, but it is really important that it's in place. Um, I was unlucky enough to have some um, Sort of personal circumstances when my dissertation was due in um, and as well as having my personal tutor there to give me support you will find members of staff um, as you go through the course that you can identify as someone who can help you um, and the head of genetics was really helpful i told him what was going on um, and he was really keen to kind of support me through that and make sure that my dissertation um, that i was able to hand it in on time and if i wasn't that i would have the support there to enable me to get an extension and things luckily i did manage to get it in on time and then um, i emailed him to let her know that i had and he said oh don't worry i went to go check the pile because i wanted to make sure you definitely managed to <laughs> so it really does show that the staff really care um, within the school and i felt really supported all the way through my degree Great, thank you. Okay, the next question is one for Nick. Uh, so this is an international student who's wondering how to apply for their T4 visa. Well, the tier four visa process, um, it is complicated, but you shouldn't be overly worried about it. As soon as you've got your results, assuming you have an unconditional offer, uh, sorry, assuming you have a conditional offer, when you get your results, that will automatically transfer to what we call an unconditional offer because you've met the conditions that you need to come to Newcastle. At that point, the university will be in touch with you. They will send you out something called a CAS letter, and that kicks off the whole visa process. Getting visas, I know from personal experience, can be a little bit sort of traumatic, but we will try and do as much as we can to support you. We can't apply for your visa on your behalf. You still do have to do the work. But as I say, we've got an excellent visa team who will help you throughout the whole process. OK, thanks. Would you like to say anything about uh, your experience of applying for visas and so on? Then? Yeah, so I'd say the visa team are incredibly helpful. Any questions I had? Um, you know, they uh, sorted them out. Any problems I had, they sorted them out really quickly. Great. So, yeah. Good. OK, the next question again, I think this is really one for students, which is what are the sports facilities like uh, and what sports can you get involved in? And will you have time to do that while studying for your degree? So I'll start with you, Jen. Um, so we've got really great sport facilities. Um, the uni's investing a lot of money in sport as well at the moment. So we've already got our sports centre which has got loads of multi-purpose rooms for different sports teams to use it's got a really great gym and um, all of the stuff that you would kind of expect from a sports facility and we are building um, a massive extension to that as well so there's going to be even more sports facilities we've got loads of sort of um pitches and external places to play sport and um, if you're part of a sports team but when it comes to the choice, there's so much choice. So pretty much any sport that you want to get involved in, there'll be a club or a society that already exists within the university. And if there's a sport that you feel like is underrepresented, then you can also start your own society whilst you're here at the university. So whatever you want to do, you'll definitely be able to do it at Newcastle. Um, and I really enjoyed trying loads of new sports and um, different activities when I was here as a student as well. It was something that really I felt added to my degree and it was a great way to make friends outside of my course. As for having enough time, you definitely do have enough time. Um, it all depends on how you work. So you might be the kind of person who wants to um, stay in university all day and make sure you get all of your work done and then go home and play sports and things like that or you might decide that you'd rather go out if it's sunny during the day and play sports and then do any work or assignments late at night but no matter how you manage your time there's definitely enough time to fit in any sports or social activities that you want to 
Yeah, and within the sports societies, there's also roles that you can apply for. So like the president or the treasurer, um, and you definitely have time for sports because I know a lot of my friends who take on multiple sports at the same time and they still manage to do well. So, yeah. Okay. Thank and every you. Wednesday afternoon in the UK, all universities have the afternoon off. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of competition going on between. And again, that creates the, the time and space for you to, to explore these different sports. Okay, thank you. So the next question is about what uh, do the majority of graduates go on to do after completing the degree? Uh, what are the kind of jobs that they go on to do? So um, I can answer that one. Um, so most of our graduates, um, about 50% of our graduates go on to complete a, a further degree. So they go on to further study. So that's a mixture of um, M, uh, master's level degrees and PhDs. Uh, and also some who go on to do things like um, PGCEs for teacher training or conversion courses, for example, if they want to go into something like law or accountancy. Um, of those that go directly into employment, um, it's quite a mixture. A good number go into laboratory based jobs, for example, in industry or in uh, universities. Um, but also into things like science communication, so working in the media, for example. I think Jeff, you had a, a tutee who, yeah, who did that. They actually went off to work for the BBC. They're one of the, the researchers on the Horizon series. So again, if anybody watches Horizon programmes, and what you get is some famous person who does the voiceover. It's actually a scientist, someone from, let's say, in this case, from my tutee, who actually does all the background research on the pharmacology for the, the, um, the dementia um, Horizon programme. So that was something I was really yeah. pleased to see their name on because they get their name on the credits at the end. <laughs> OK, and then some students go on to do jobs that are not laboratory based or, or, or not really science to do with science, where they're just using the other um, skills that they've developed during their degree programme. So, for example, going on to graduate management training schemes with um, big companies like Marks and Spencer's and John Lewis's. Um, so, it, it, although the majority of our students go on to uh, science-based careers, um, some just use their skills in, in other types of employment. Uh, we also have graduates who use their science background um, to do commercial type jobs like marketing and sales. So, for example, doing marketing and sales, but with a pharmaceutical uh, company or a medical sales company. Um, so there's a very wide range of, of employment opportunities. Um, some of our graduates also go on to work in cl as clinical scientists uh, in the NHS. Jeff, do you mm -hmm. want to pick up on that one? So within, within the NHS, there's not only doctors and nurses, but there are 48 other scientific professions. And in order to get onto those scientific professions, um, what you do is you get a good degree from a, a university, uh, preferably a 2-1 or a first degree, and then you apply for what's called modernising scientific careers, clinical scientist training program. So this is run by the, the NHS and Department of Health. Uh, there is an entry um, exam that you've got to do and you can find out more about that on their website. So if you just type in clinical scientist training program, you'll get more information on that. And what will happen is if you're successful on a program, you get employed for a three year contract where you actually do the job. So if you're a clinical immunologist, a clinical cardiologist, uh, like myself, I was a clinical biochemist is that you, over a three year period, learn how to do the job, that interface between the pathology laboratory and the scientific testing and the physician uh, who works out in the, as part of the, the clinical team. And during those three years, you will uh, develop your clinical skills and you'll be assessed uh, what's called a portfolio. And you complete the portfolio to show that you can work with patients. At the same time, you will do a part-time MSc in clinical genetics or whatever your subject is. So at the end of three years, you've got your qualification and your certificate of competence, and then you can apply to the Health and Care Professions Council to be a registered clinical scientist. And that then allows you to apply for uh, other positions, more senior positions, as part of the healthcare clinical team. OK, thanks, Jeff. Um, the next question that's come up is uh, we've talked about the transfer to medicine. Uh, the question is, is it the same for dentistry? Uh, and the simple answer is yes, uh, it's the same uh, process. 
but there are, as I mentioned earlier, two places available for dentistry uh, compared to seven places available uh, for medicine. Although having said that, less people tend to apply for dentistry. So the, uh, the chances of you getting a place are, are roughly the same. Uh, the next question is, um, and I'll pass this one over to um, Jenny, if that's OK, which is when will we receive information on Freshers Week? Is okay. that OK for you? Or yeah, of course. That, yeah? No, no. So um, Freshers Week at Newcastle is run by our students' union, but it's also run by a team of volunteers. So at other universities, um, it might be people who work at the university every single year. But at Newcastle, we actually, the student body votes for the people they want to organise Freshers Week the next year. And then Freshers Week is run by those organisers and a team of students who volunteer. So it's a really great way to get new students integrated within the university community. So when you'll find out is during the summer. So during the summer, um, once you've got your place, you'll get some information from the university on Freshers Week, telling you how you can go about buying a wristband, which will give you access to all of the activities put on during Freshers Week. Um, if you want to find out more as it gets closer, then you can go to the Students' Union website, which is NUSU. Um, .ac.uk. You could just type in Newcastle Students Union on Google and I'm sure it'll come up. Um, and as Freshers Week gets closer, it pretty much gets taken over by links to Freshers Week. So you won't have a problem finding the information that you need. But yeah, you'll find all of that out in the summer. OK, thanks. How about when you were coming? Did you get information in good time, Vanessa? Yeah, I think um, everything was on the website. They had a countdown, didn't they? Yeah, to, countdown to Freshers uh, Week. To countdown to Freshers Week. And uh, everything was on the website, how to purchase a wrist, wristband, etc. Everything was on there. Yeah, it's a really inclusive week as well. So lots of people, when they think about Newcastle as a city, think about sort of the reputation it has for evening social life when it comes to sort of alcohol and things but that's not all Freshers Week has to offer there's something for everyone so if you're not the kind of person who wants to go out on a big night out there's comedy nights at the stand that you get to go to as part of Freshers Week there's nights at the Theatre Royal which is our local theatre and um, there's loads of different things that you can do that don't involve alcohol and there's loads of day activities as well if you're someone who likes to just cozy up at night time and not leave the house so there's definitely something for everyone during Freshers Week too. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is about opportunities to continue with things like um, music and language uh, if you come to the university. Um, so there are um, opportunities to take, for example, uh, supernumerary modules. So these are modules which uh, don't count towards your final degree classification, but will appear on your degree transcript. Uh, and you can do these modules in a, a variety of languages. Um, so I don't know if either of you did any of the yeah. language modules. You did, yeah? Um, I actually did uh, French during semester one of this year, and it was so good because it's open to everyone. So you had, um, you can meet people from different courses. There were accounting and finance people there, agriculture. So it was nice to meet different people from different courses. And it was, the activities were really fun as well because um, uh, you did loads of speaking, activities um listening so i'd say it wasn't like a normal lecture um there were about 10 to 15 students so it w it felt more like a more like a seminar than a lecture so it's a lot more interactive I, yeah i'd say it's a lot more fun as well doing the super new module okay um and in terms of music i think uh, that would be mostly through the societies in the students union there's lots of opportunities for taking uh, taking part in a whole range of musical activities. Have you uh, taken part in any yourself? Or um, I'm not you taking part in any musical activities, but I know that there's a lot of different societies within the Students' Union to get involved in. We've got everything from kind of sort of more classical musical societies right the way to the DJ society. So if you are interested in kind of carrying on with some music whilst you're studying your biomedical sciences degree, there's definitely opportunities to do that. Um, and often some of the musical society get involved with lots of different events. So um, various different societies, whether it be sort of the medicine theatre society might ask for help 
from someone from a music society to come and help them with their event. I held events for a society I worked with and we had some music students help us cut all of our songs and things. So there's definitely um, lots of opportunities to get involved in music in lots of different ways. One of the best things I went to last year was the University of the Students host this international music and arts um, event. Mm. And it was a fantastic night. One of my game, one of my tutees, he plays uh, Indian violin and he'd got his a little band together uh, and they were doing one session. And I, so I got invited along, but I'm so pleased that I went. In fact, the whole evening, there was about 12 different acts, if we've given it another name, but they're from everything. We had traditional Indonesian uh, music with dancers. We had Irish jig. We had, we had Morris dancers. Um, as well as this Indian thing, but there was Chinese cultural, there was everything from every international culture I could think of. And then for the break in between, a lot of the societies had set up food, so I could go and have a bit of Indian food, <laughs> Indonesian food, Malaysian food. And it was just a fantastic night, it cost two quid. It was great. Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, sorry, just bear with me, I'm just trying to find the next uh, question. Uh, yeah, OK, so this is going back to the question about pre-arrival information, but this is about international mm -hmm. students. So what opportunities do international students have to get information before they arrive? Um, well, again, a lot of this will be sent out by the university. Um, there's a sort of international induction week which occurs before the main uh, freshers week and the induction weeks with uh, in the university. What I advise all international students to do is actually make sure you fly directly into Newcastle Airport itself. So from pretty much anywhere in the world, you can come via Dubai, Amsterdam or Paris, easily change planes there, uh, avoid London if you can, and come into our uh, international airport at Newcastle. It's then a very simple 23 minute uh, train journey into the centre of town and right to the campus. We also have a welcoming team there to help you get onto the metro or they may put on a bus if there's a lot of people coming in on a flight to help you get down to the campus and then they will direct you to your halls of residence and help you sort of move in and find your way around. And as I say there's also the International Induction Week which will really help you sort of get to know fellow students in the university and from those and from the staff you'll learn the best supermarkets to go to if you're looking for particular foods or how to post a letter or setting up your bank a whole range of different things so we do as much as we can to support you we send out information early on and then we have uh, an induction week for the international students within the school of biomedical sciences we also have a little sort of day trip out last year we went out on a boat uh, down the river Tyne this year we may be going to one of the local museums possibly mm. called Beamish which is an interesting open air museum and we also have an international lunch fairly early on with the international students just so they can get to know each other and uh, ask any questions that they may have about life in Newcastle things that they're finding a little bit odd or difficult or strange to deal with so yes, a lot of support there to help you settle in and get the most out of Newcastle University. Yeah, I'd say the induction week was really helpful. Um, you can meet students, uh, other international students, because they're probably they're going through the same thing, so they're a bit um, scared or nervous as well. Um, and there's also um, international days at the Civic Centre. I think they they ran them last year, and I couldn't attend one this year. But basically, they have stores where they um, tell you ways in which you can um, volu volunteer so you could um, um, volunteer at a hospice or at the hospital and it's just um, um, ways to help you integrate into the community. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, the next question is um, about uh, whether you can access lecture slides after the lectures. Uh, so I can answer that one, which is uh, that, yes, uh, in fact, we put lecture slides uh, on our virtual learning environment, which is called Blackboard, um, in advance of the lectures. So uh, most of the slides will go up uh, 48 hours before the lecture takes place. So that gives you a chance to have a look at the lecture slides uh, before you come along to the lecture. So you know what to expect. Um, and we also record the majority of lectures using a system called Recap. Uh, and that means that you can go back and review the lecture um, after uh, after it's taken place uh, so that you can go back, for example, if there was a point that you 
uh, didn't didn't quite understand the first time round, uh, you can go back and listen to it again. Uh, so the students find that really useful uh, for uh, revising the, the lecture material and, and, and helping them to um, move move forward with their learning. Um, students, how do you? Um, I thought recap was really useful. Um, I kind of got used to using it finally in my in my third year. I used it a bit in first and second year, but for my final year exams, it was really, really helpful. Um, and I kind of got into a habit of recapping a lecture just after it happened. And then when I was doing my end of year revision, because obviously you've got all of your lectures and then you don't have any lectures whilst you're doing your research project because that's what you focused on. And then you might need to revisit all of that material before you do your final exams. So it was really useful then to be able to kind of reattend all of my lectures in the comfort of my own home with cups of tea and to be able to pause it when I lost concentration and things. Um, and another good thing about recap is you can actually speed up or slow down the lectures. So if someone's speaking a bit quickly, you can slow it down a little bit, or if, um, you know, you're trying to get through a lecture in a, a short amount of time because you've got lots to cover. You can speed it up a little bit as long as you can still understand everything that's being said. Um, and that's a technique that I use to kind of recover all of my material for my final year. And I found that really, really useful. So I found it great. Yeah, I'd say recap is my main um, tool for revision because uh, you can go over the lectures as many times as you like. Um, and if you've missed one, um, if you're ill or something, you can uh, you, you always have recaps, so you, you don't have to rely on the friend's notes. For yeah, the lecturers are really good about it as well. I had one lecturer where he'd um, given us a lecture and the recap hadn't worked properly. Um, and he sort of went out of his way to give us access to the previous, when he delivered that lecture the previous year, so that we still had access to all of that information. And he even said to us, oh, if I can't manage to get you last year's lecture, I'll just go into a seminar room and re-deliver the lecture to an empty room. So you guys can watch it if you need to. So the staff are really dedicated. I'm not saying everyone would <laughs> necessarily go to those lengths, but they are really dedicated. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we're probably drawing to an end now. Um, so if you'd like to put up any final questions you might have, uh, and if we don't get a chance to answer them now, we'll, um, as, I, as I mentioned at the start, we'll get back to you uh, after the webinar is closed. Um, I'm just skimming through here. Uh, just a couple of last questions. The first one is, do I need to buy many books? Jeff, do you want to pick up on that one? I'm a bibliophile, I love books, and I've still got the books that I had from when I was a student. So I, I would say yes, invest. But to be honest with you, um, some students don't buy textbooks. And there is a really th uh, thriving second-hand book system. So yeah. what tends to happen is students will buy them, the recommended text for the first year, gets them through that first year. And what tends to happen is you then move on to scientific journals because it's about cutting edge research. And a textbook is quite often three to five years out of date. So as you shift from textbooks to uh, scientific journals, then that's when the students tend to, to sell their, their textbooks. Um, to be honest, it's sources for courses. Uh, we will show you the different textbooks. We will recommend ones that we would suggest, but we don't insist that you buy them. I would just add to that, actually, with my tutees, what I suggest that they do is use our fantastic library facilities mm. to look at the textbooks. And if there's one that they really find useful and that really works for them, then possibly buy it because, you know, it, it is an investment for the long term. And when I was a student last uh, century, that's the way I worked. I looked at the textbooks in the library. We were recommended three different textbooks on the same subject and I bought the one that really worked for me and that I felt most comfortable with and fitted my learning style so don't buy textbooks before you come certainly not get here look at the recommended test them out in the library and then if you want to buy one buy the one that really works for you yeah, I'd have to agree Um the course I did before I did biomedical sciences I fell foul of that went out and spent about 250 pound on books that I never read um, and then struggled to flog the next year so when I came to study biomed, I looked at my reading list, went to the library and got everything um, I needed from a reading list from the library because it is all available there. Um, and it's quite useful within the university. You can get an app for your phone. So you don't have to bring your book back in. If you need to renew it, you can just renew it from your phone. So if you get an alert saying your book's due back today and you've left it at home, you can just press a button on your phone. And as long as no one else is waiting for that book, 
um, it's really easy to do. So I got away with not buying any books during my course. It does depend on whether or not you really like a good book, but if there was one that we felt that we needed and there wasn't enough of one, we could put a request on it or we could just share it between um, a group of us. So if a group of us were revising together and a number of different books were suggested, we'd all take out a different one um, and kind of share notes and things. So you can get away with, with not buying any if, if that's what you want to do. And I think maybe one last question, um, which is definitely for you guys, which is about accommodation. Uh, it's asking you to put your neck on the line and say, what's the best accommodation and what's the closest to the biomedical sciences building? Um, closest you can probably definitively say, but as for the best, it does all come down to personal preference so you might think that the best accommodation is the cheapest in which case you might want something like St Mary's which is a, one of the furthest ones out and um, it's a bit of a longer walk in about 35 minutes and you there's a bus put on every morning um, and afternoon that's, that's free for students that live there but it's quite a nice place to live there's free parking there and um, it's self-catered but you've got a basin in your room and it's got a nice communal area. I've got a couple of friends that were upset that they were put there and then ended up absolutely loving it and were so glad that they'd been there. But that is very, very different to some of the accommodation that's perhaps in the city centre in sort of the tall tower blocks where you've got an ensuite bathroom, um, a double bed, you know, you're sharing with less people, but it might be quite a bit more expensive. So there's not really a best accommodation it's about thinking about which one's the right one for you um, and just indicating your preferences when you apply for you know do you care most about what bathroom you have do you care most about how close you are to the university do you care most about the price it's up to you and what's what's right for you um you've probably visited lots of accommodations and have a favorite yeah. um i definitely recommend turner court um it was really useful for me because i don't cook so it was useful having the tesco's downstairs um, um, and it was also en suite as well. It was really nice because it was built recently. So um, that was another plus. Um, and also it's quite social as well. So if that's what you're looking for, I'd recommend that. But then Castle Lees is, is uh, really close to the medical school as well. Um, but I don't think um, there are any en suite rooms in Castle Lees, right? No, not in Castle Lees, no. no. Um, so if, if en suite is what you're looking for, then all the rooms in Turner Court are en suite. So it depends on what you prefer. Really? Yeah, they've slowly been redoing and building lots of accommodation at the university. So the kind of worst accommodation that was available when I was I first came to university is gone now and it's all relatively nice. So it's quite difficult to compare them all. Um, but they are all mostly new and there are a lot of ensuite um, options for you as well, if that's what you're after. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all of the panel for joining us this morning and to those of you who've signed into the webinar. Uh, if you have any more questions uh, that we haven't yet answered, as I say, we will get back to you after the webinar is closed. Uh, and do feel free to contact us with any, any questions that you might have, uh, either by email um, or again through the chat, uh, and, we'll, and we'll get back to you. So thank you very much uh, and goodbye.